Hello, I'm Lars Thuesen. Um, I am very delighted to uh, be here and talk about um, social change. Um, I have a deep passion for social welfare change. I've been working as a change leader in the public sector for many years. Um, we see a lot of challenges. Uh, we see a lot of citizens that are actually, if we help them and support them in other ways, could have better lives. So that's what I'm very passionate about. And that is my quest to actually go and help change that. Um, we are facing in, in our world a lot of wicked social welfare changes, and I will just be able to mention a few. Um, we have we are struggling with lowering constraints within the psychiatric field, within the psychiatric hospitals. Um, we are struggling with uh, inmates uh, not reoffending when they get out of, of the prison system. Uh, we are struggling with uh, juveniles uh, not dropping out of schools. And there are a lot of other social wicked issues that we, we need to deal with. Um, and they are very there are many very good people that deal with that and they try to do their best but we are not very successful so i think we should do things in other ways and i will be talking about that um, in my work and in our work we found that if we look at what we call vulnerable citizens that's the the target groups or the citizens we were just i was just mentioning before um, if we focus on relationships, uh, that's a very, very strong uh, thing to do. And if we can do that effectively, we can actually create and sustain uh, good solutions. So I'll tell you two small stories. I've been working a lot within the prison system um, and two small stories to illustrate that. When um, an inmate is received in a maximum security prison, the usual procedure is that you need to sit down uh, and you need to uh, do a lot of uh, paperwork, typing on the computer, etc. And you s sit at a desk as, as a guard and uh, the inmate sits on the other side. Um, that creates a distance immediately. And it will also... Uh, uh, well, you will not be talking about what, what's important for the inmate. So what we found in our practice is that there was one guard, he was also called Lars, by the way, um, and what he did was instead of sitting down at the desk, he said, hello, what would you like to be called? Tom. Okay, Tom, why don't I give you a tour? And then we can talk and you can see the, the sites. And then we'll, we, need it, we need to do a little paperwork. Uh, but we can do that afterwards. Would that be all right with you? Great. Good. So Lars was giving Tom a tour, and um, they got to talk about a lot of important stuff, uh, about Tom's life, about Tom's dreams, about his fears, and he related to him um, in a very good way from the beginning. And what actually happened was that Lars... Uh, he was, in his way of connecting with Tom, he was able to work with him on rehabilitation issues later on in a much better way than the other guards. And what we also found was that Lars was a healthier guard than the other ones. He came to work, he was happy at work, he wasn't absent, um, he had uh, fewer incidents of threats and violence than the others, and so on. So that was the story about Lars. There was a female guard also that I would like to mention. <coughs> um, in maximum security prison, it's usually like, like that. If you, um, you sit in your cell, you are there for many hours. Uh, you will uh, have to press a bell if you want to get out and go to the toilet or whatever. And the bell will be ringing in uh, the guard's room. Um, and it's a little bit irritating. It, it, it's, they are in the middle of something, the guards, 
um, they may be reading papers or they are maybe uh, doing something else. But of course they will be getting up um, and, and go to the room. Um, and they will, keys are really important in prisons. So they will take the key and they will go quickly to and they will open the door. Yes. There was this female guard. She was doing it differently. Uh, when the bell rang, she thought, this must be important. So she got up immediately and she made a little noise with the keys when she was walking to the door and she was knocking on the door, knock, knock. She was putting the key in the keyhole, waiting a little bit opening and then uh, she asked what can I do for you so the whole difference when we talked with the inmates about that was that she respected the inmate and she was also in the same way as Lars the other guard able to relate able to build a relationship that made it possible to work with the inmate um, and again healthier life came to work less incidents of threats and violence, etc. So these are two small stories about how we have been working with relationships. Um, the approach that lies behind all this um, has some fundamental principles that I would like to mention. So one is that we are looking for people who are performing better than others. It's the usual uh, bell curve where we have high performing people uh, over here and low performing people over here. So instead of focusing on the people who are not doing it well, we focus on people who do it well and better than others. Lars and the female um, guard. Another fundamental principle is that we try to learn from things that are already happening. So we try to learn from already existing behavior. So Lars was already doing a tour. The female guard was already uh, opening the door in another way. Um, what's really important <coughs> also is that we look for the what and the how. So it's not enough to know uh, that Lars is giving a tour. We need to know how he's doing the tour, how he's talking with the inmate. We also need to know how the door is being opened in a very gentle way, etc. So it, we need to know the DNA of the behavior in order to learn from it. A fourth principle is that, and that's it's when we talk about uh, dissemination and implementation and other guards that are learning from, from the deviants, uh, is that we try, instead of talking a lot about it, we try to show it and we try to do it together instead of talking about it. So we say that it's easier to act our way into a new way of thinking instead of thinking our way into a new way of acting. A fifth um, principle is that um, very often we talk about grandiose things. Here, that's not important. Uh, we say that the genius lies in the banalities. So it's very, very practical, small, uh, daily routines that we are looking for that will make the whole difference. Um, a sixth principle is that uh, it's another type of social um, approach to change. Uh, so we will be working inside out instead of top down. So we will not be the managers, it will not be the consultants, it will not be uh, experts telling people what to do. It will be the communities, it will be the system of people that owns the problems, they will be, be the ones uh, defining and looking for the behavior that works. Um, that will, of course, demand another leadership role. Leaders, leaders will have to create and find spaces where conversations can happen, provide resources. Um, they will also help in nourishing and 
uh, getting the stories out when, once they are there. But they will not direct the problem definition and they will not direct what kind of solutions we will be looking for. Um, very often in our work, we see that we work very well within our silos, within our organizations, uh, that might be prisons, it might be other public institutions, etc. Um, I think, well, I talked about the first quest to do the change. I think if we are going to do that effectively, we need to put people together from different silos working with the citizen in the middle. So that could be the second quest, uh, that we should work more uh, effectively with people across silos. Finally, um, I would like to say that uh, we are initiating and creating a network. It's called the Welfare Improvement Network, um, where we will uh, like to gather practitioners uh, to think about these issues, to learn from each other, and I would like to invite um, people to join. Thank you. <laughs>